We are pleased to bring together so many members of the McGill community to discuss the issue of sexual assault on college and university campuses tonight. It is our goal this evening to raise awareness of the issue and to discuss how we can come together as a community to create a culture of change. McGill has not been immune from the issue of sexual assault, and while we are happy to see that positive changes have started to take place on campus, we are even more excited about where we can go. As many of you may know, a sexual assault policy has been in development over the past two years. While McGill does currently have a harassment, sexual harassment, and discrimination policy, there is no specific policy that takes a pro-survivor approach to sexual assault. It is now my pleasure to introduce Lucy Lassinger from the Sexual Assault Policy Group to give you a brief overview of what they've been working on. So before we begin tonight, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge that this film does cover topics that can be upsetting and hard to think about, including both sexual assault and suicide. These topics have affected members of our community, some of whom may be here tonight. If you wish to take a break at any time throughout the screening, please feel free to do so. The washrooms are in the basement of this building, and unfortunately there are no gender neutral washrooms, however those can be found in snow. We also have active listeners at the back of the room available if anyone would like to speak with them. Can they please identify themselves? Over there, knitted down here, and over there. And we have private areas where you can go speak if you would like to do so. In addition, I want to make some important disclaimers about this film. First of all, it's based in the United States, and as such, the political climate and reporting system is very different than what we have here in Canada. A large portion of this documentary focuses on Title IX, an amendment made to the American Civil Rights Law that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex against any person in education programs and activities receiving federal funding. This is not something we have in Canada. After the screening, our panelists will touch on the differences between Title IX and the reporting in Canadian, in the Canadian university context. Secondly, this documentary focuses a lot on fraternity life and the culture surrounding athletics. We do have fraternities and sororities, some of whose members are here, and the culture and the culture of the atmosphere is very different here at Miguel. Additionally, while we certainly recognize the financial contribution of these organizations to American universities can certainly generate inequalities within their system, this system does not exist in the way it is portrayed in this documentary at Miguel. Sexual assault does not discriminate, and we believe that not, no single person or group of students should be focused, should be the focus on. Rather, we should work together to address this issue as a collective community. Finally, this documentary uses the word rape frequently and throughout. That is because the word is used in the U.S. Criminal Code, which is not the case in Canada. You will not hear us as organizers, the panelists, or other speakers use this word, and it does not appear in the sexual assault policy, because in Canada, sexual assault is the official criminal offense. I believe Lucy has heard. So she will now speak about the sexual assault policy and the work that they've been doing. Sorry about that. I went to the bathroom. I didn't realize I was just speaking. <clears throat> so, um, I am here today as a representative of the Sexual Assault Policy Working Group. Uh, we've been working on the policy for about a year and a half now, and it's in its final like, stages. So, yeah, the Sexual Assault Policy was created as a resource for people who have experienced sexual assault. And there are three guiding principles that we've used to both structure our working group and to set, the, set terms for the kind of policy that we want to produce. These principles are anti-oppression, non-directionality, and pro-survivor, and I'll be talking a little bit about what those three terms mean. We're continuously working to make sure the policy matches these principles and is as accessible as possible by all groups. Part of the reason we're doing this is because we recognize that marginalized groups face higher rates of violence, specifically sexual violence. For example, women of color and trans women are at higher risk 
Taking an anti-oppressive stance in terms of the policy means that we seek to use language and implement procedures within our policy that do not perpetuate systems of oppression and violence. So an example of that would be using the term uh, person who has experienced sexual assault rather than victim. Um, if you'd like to talk more about like why we didn't, we chose not to use the term survivor in our policy, I'd be really happy to like, have a conversation about that. Um, furthermore, as a non-directional policy, we have formulated it in such a way that someone accessing these resources um, would not be pushed to take one like a certain course of action over another. This is really important, specifically in our context and in the context of an epidemic of sexual assault in American Canadians you know, in Canadian universities. And one of the major problems that we're seeing is that people who have experienced sexual assault are encouraged to take certain courses of action, for example, going to the police, without the recognition that different people have different needs. Accessing the police institution, for example, can be very triggering and has different implications for people depending on their race, on their gender, or sexuality. Finally, being pro survivor, uh, both internally as a working group and in terms of the policy we're producing has been central. While pro-survivor can include a lot of things, mostly for this policy it means that we support uh, survivors of sexual assault and want to provide them with resources which they can access safely without any sort of victim blaming. Um, our current version of the policy is in its final stages and has seen a lot of really important edits over the last couple of men months, including um, like changes in language and changes in structure. Our plan is to put the policy to Senate in October and November uh, in the fall, like, next fall semester. And uh, hopefully it'll be passed then, crossing our fingers. Uh, between now and then, though, we'll be working primarily on consultation. We're hoping to have an online survey ready by the end of the semester, and we're planning a town hall in September so that we can add any final suggestions. And then over the summer and into the next semester, we'll, so, we'll also be doing individual consultation with groups at McGill and in Montreal. Um, I'm supposed to have a paper so you can sign up for an email list serve, but I did not prepare this. I will pass it around though. So if you want to get involved, um, we have like one really big list serve where people get like updated every once in a while, and then we have a smaller list serve for people who are actually on the working group. So if you want to get involved with either of either of those things, there will be a paper passing around. The, uh, you can put your email address on it. Just somebody get it back to me by the end of this event. That would be really nice. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. 
people who watch the movie and just anybody who can share if they want to make comments or raise questions or concerns. There's so many things that are happening right now with our sexual assault policy that's eventually going to go, I think, in the fall for review. But also just this larger conversation on campus. We um, definitely feel free to contribute. Just please bear in mind that these uh, subjects are quite sensitive. So that being said, I'm going to introduce our panelists. You guys already met Lucy earlier. If I breathe, okay, for you, I will not breathe. Um, so the first is Dean Andrick's Kostopolis. Close enough? Oh, I hate hearing that. I'll have to practice later. Uh, the Dean of Students has primary responsibility for protecting student rights, fostering academic integrity, and providing impartial oversight of the Code of Student Conduct and Disciplinary Procedures. In case of an emergency or crisis involving those students, as individuals or as a group, on campus or anywhere in the world, the Office of the Dean of Students is the main contact. The Dean of Students works closely with both student services and security services to ensure student safety and well being on both campuses. I've also heard a little bit of flu. Is that true? Right, like, yeah. Okay, well, that's confirmed. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> our next panelist is Bianca Tetro. Uh, she is the liaison officer for the Office of the Dean of Students for Harm Reduction. She is responsible for developing and implementing sustainable educational programming resources and events that promote awareness about sexual assault while fostering an inclusive, respectful, and safe environment on those campuses. She acts as a central liaison for the university's units and groups who are involved in matters related to sexual assault and other forms of harm. I'm sorry for you for the program. I should have made it this morning, so I should know this better, but I don't. And uh, our next panelist is Amanda Unruh. Can you close that phone? What is it? Unruh. Unruh. All right. I'll practice. Um, Amanda is a Miguel's Health Promotion Promotion Coordinator, where she oversees peer health educators that organize online and in-person outreach to students on campus. Helping Miguel connect students to resources, support, and information to help you live healthy. Helping Miguel has a focus on sexual health and healthy relationships with a focus to outline our groups such as sex positive, harm reduction, and non judgmental. The sexual health team integrates these methods into workshops, campaigns, and events in hopes of promoting sexual health and knowledge within the community. And I'm going to move fast, but we also have this on paper. So. And um, lastly, I think maybe you should introduce yourself because you, we were lucky enough to get Francis on this panel, but I do not know her. It's located in the basement of the SMU building, if you know it. Um, we offer a variety of support services, workshops, uh, advocacy. Our A branch uh, helps students navigate the sexual harassment and, harassment and discrimination policy. We've also been active working on the sexual assault policy, so check us out at sacoms.org. Yeah, Sorry, that was the first. Um, okay, well, thank you to all the panelists for joining us this evening. And I'm going to just start, start it off really easily. Not easily, but a simple question, which is that if anybody's willing, you guys all saw the film today, some of you saw it earlier, and then if anybody would just like to share their initial thoughts on how they felt after watching it. And obviously, please feel free to share your opinions as honestly as you want. There are a lot of issues with the film, both if you like documentaries and you watch a lot of Netflix, you know that there were some things up with that, but if you have anything to share that's critical, that's always welcome as well. So if anybody would like to volunteer to go first. You don't mind yeah, I can volunteer. Um, I, yeah, I am. Um, yeah, definitely for me watching the film, there's like sort of the, the criticism, but also the appreciation just because, like, work, having like worked with survivors for years and working with student activists as well, like seeing those activists doing that work in that film is so incredibly inspiring. Uh, like, the bravery and like, the courage that takes, like, that to me was, you know, very uh, emotional for me. Uh, but yeah, at the same time, um, sort of the, we were talking a bit about this earlier, but like the similarity of a lot of the stories, sort of the, this narrative of this, uh, you know, not only, but like usually a white woman, uh, perfect student, like valedictorian, and being like a self by a stranger and feeling like that isn't deserved, and not that that's not true, because of course it is, and those stories are, are real, but that like there's no one story of sexual assault, and that people's experiences are really different. Which was mentioned earlier in the film, it never really followed up with. So, yeah, I would like to see a greater like diversity of survivors' experiences represented in the film. Yeah, yeah uh, just to like echo that. Um, yeah, most of the survivors in uh, that movie were white. Uh, pretty much everyone was normal. also like maybe like a few token people of color and um, like no indigenous people to like also 
face like ridiculously high rates of sexual assault. So yeah, that's my big. And then also like the two main stories that were like really focused on was like the Catholic, um, like the student at St. Mary's who obviously like there is like a lot of appeal in America for that kind of story where there's somebody who's like very religious who is like like cis. So I think that's yeah, very much a sweetheart, which like of course like like her story is so important and like like I would want to hear that story, but it just sucks when like nobody else's story is being heard. And then the other like really big story that was focused on like uh, in the film was the like case where the person who had sexually assaulted her was a black guy, and like I think that we can't let that not go noted. You know, like we have to. turn it off. Well, thank you very much for that, for those comments. If no one in the audience wishes to make a comment, I'll just ask a second. Yep. Person. The person who is experiencing sexual assault, um, and I don't push a lot of owners on them, but I think there are plenty of educational initiatives, and I'm wondering what the bill is doing now with regards to that. I'm not yeah, thank you. Great question. Um, so this year, we've done a lot of work um, with different faculty members, staff, and students at McGill here to create um, a community culture to bring people together to recognize that it takes a community to stop sexual assault.
consultant that can only do like this game. So like that's education that people need as well to, to know uh, what sort of situations they're in or if they're coming with other people. Sure. So. Uh, uh, <coughs> Why don't we let the last response go and then absolutely please. Sure, the, the point about education is key. Right? Obviously, universities are places where people grow, uh, and everybody does that. Whether you're a freshman student or, or a faculty member, universities are places where we're expected to learn and grow. And uh, a part of what we have to do is have this conversation in our community uh, about consent, for example. And I think we've been putting a lot of effort. Speak up a little? Yeah, yeah. So one of the main theses that I saw during the film was the fact that the, the main perpetrators of these crimes are uh, are coming from the athletics and the fraternity communities, and then they trace it back one step further. And why are these uh, associations still allowed on the college campuses? It's because of the money that comes in from these organizations. And I would like to know uh, in Canada, it, are these same uh, reasons, uh, the same logic applicable to the Canadian universities or no? I'll answer the question about Greek life in a minute. If anybody would like to comment on athletics, maybe if like the same well, relationships exist. You're, you're pointing to a systemic argument that's made in, in the movie, right? And uh, it has it has a few parts. Uh, the incentive system for U.S. universities is very messed up. They have on the one hand, the, I think it's the Clery Act specifically that uh, mandates them to. funding, uh, but depends on equal opportunity for women, and so on the one hand, uh, they have to report sexual assaults. On the other hand, if they report sexual assaults, their funding may get cut uh, because they're demonstrating that they're not a safe environment for women. So that, not surprisingly, that has very, very bad impacts on uh, I think the behavior of U.S. school that's the first systemic argument made in the film, and the situation is very, very different in Canada because we don't have those those two elements. Uh, you know, and I don't want to make too much of the differences between the Canadian and the uh, U.S. context because the situation is far from perfect here, but the specific elements that are named in that movie are not present here. In terms of athletics and, um, and uh, fraternities, uh, they say in the film, for example, that U.S. institutions have contractual relationships with fraternities. Canadian institutions, by and large, don't. McGill, for example, has no contractual relationship with any fraternity. They don't have an official presence on campus. Um, so that that is one major difference. Also, it's also a much much smaller portion of our population that's uh, in fraternities. Uh, athletics, as you saw from the images in the film, uh, athletics has a very different status in most Canadian. center of cultural life in, in, uh, at McGill, in the same way that the Sun Dogs are at uh, ASU, for example. Uh, it's, it's huge over there. It's, it's dominant uh, as a force. So all those differences, of course, mean that the problem has a different shape here, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Uh, and so you know, once we've established those differences, I think, I think we need to focus on thing that is different, I think, is the level of support that we extend to uh, people who've experienced sexual assault. Uh, I, I mean, some of what I saw in the film was, was quite shocking in terms of that, and, and I think I can on, honestly say that it's different here. That part is different. Uh, but the, it's interesting to me that some of the same outcomes, the underreporting and the lack of 
consequences. Uh, and also the isolation that survivors who feel are produced here by a very different set of factors, by a different systemic configuration than what produces them in the US. But they are produced. Right? So that to me, I'm a systems guy, you know, that's my research. That to me is very, very interesting that you have similar outcomes produced by very different systems. And that's a real question for me. I'm, trying, I'm struggling to understand that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd just like to address the last point that you brought up, that there are the systems at place that, are being, that we're not addressing in this film, and that are producing the same kinds of results in Canadian universities as they are in American universities. And I think those are cultural those are cultural systems that perpetuate sexual assault as like an acceptable form of oppression. And so a lack of consult, consent culture. So perpetuating the, the idea that like consent is just like, okay, maybe somebody else should speak to this because <laughs> I'm like having more time finding my words. But yeah. Um just to step back for a second though, like the question of the cultural differences are is a a bit large because in Greek life, for example, in the United States, the drinking age is not 18, it's 21. So at, on most college campuses, you'll require fraternities to be providing alcohol for the student body. So obviously that will cause fraternities to have a disproportionate amount of, so, of social capital or power. In addition, in most, uh, many big American universities, m many more students live on campus all four years. And that is a huge difference from us where a huge proportion of our student body is their native Montrealers. They live wherever they want to live, you know? And the other difference is that for Greek life, there's, while there's no formal affiliation with McGill, that doesn't mean that they're not necessarily McGill chapters. All four, McGill, so all four sororities identify as McGill sororities. The president of the Panhellenic Council is actually here. It's Emily Brown. You can ask her questions about it. The Greek community has been really helpful. A bunch of them are here. Some of my sisters are here. But it's very, very different from the United States, especially when it comes to not the, the, the relationship between fraternity sororities and university because a lot of the fraternities I believe are mixed amongst universities like Concordia, McGill, and UDM so they're not like singularly even all McGill which is very different from the US context so those are just like three really big things and if anybody knows of any documentaries about sexual assault on Canadian campuses let us know because we could not find one. Uh, were there other, I saw the comments from the audience, yes, Professor Berman.
right? So it says, I mean, okay, I guess like it's easy for me to say I think SACOMS is an amazing organization, but it really is. And uh, we've been on campus at McGill since the late, like 89 or like 1991. I actually don't know the exact date, probably know. <laughs> so yeah, we've been here for a long time doing the, the type of support work, which I think is not necessarily the most important work, but like the most essential short term work that needs to be done. Because yeah, like you, like we saw in this documentary, and that's this is something I definitely recognize from work with survivors is like, yeah, the feeling that after the assault is potentially just as bad or almost worse as bad the assault because of the reaction that they're that they're getting from people. So um, yeah, I think for everyone like supporting the survivors in their lives and, and knowing how to do that is an extremely important skill because they're everywhere. I don't know if that answers your question. We have a follow up from another SACOMS. Sabina, if you'd like to say something, and then I believe you can talk to Yeah. services that do all those things uh, when people request it. So it's, uh, but it's obviously it's a constant, uh, we have to constantly be working on this. And uh, if there are particular points of contact that are problematic, let us know and we will work on it. Um, one of the biggest changes that I've seen regarding service and the nurses get constant disclosures from people who are wondering, do I need to go to a hospital? Do I need to go and get a forensic kit? That's what was colloquially known as the rape kit in the film. Um, so the nurses get these disclosures day in and day out and they take people to the hospital or CLC Metro where they need to go. They actually took it upon themselves to create their own trainings and to reach out to all of these organizations recognizing that this is an issue. Um, and it's been really inspiring to, from there, see um, the Office of the Dean of Students take a 
really uh, leading role in coordinating all of these teams on campus to make sure that we are reaching all of the points of contact and it's not just um, silos who see this as an issue. Just piggybacking on that and add, like, and talking about education, like this, this is kind of a cheesy thing to say, but it's an educational experience for all of us, like something like that, like nurses having to build their own training in order to support survivors or like for the administration coming to realize like the issues on campus and how to address them. You know, it's not going to try to improve our services to be more accessible to a wider diversity of survivors. Like, we're all constantly learning about it, and I think sometimes it can get into the mentality that's like, okay, here are like the experts who know what they're talking about against everyone else, and like, really, hopefully, we can work together so everyone knows a bit more. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah. Um, okay, my name is Yang. I, I initially volunteered for Okay, my name is Yan. I initially set out to volunteer as a listener, but apparently I didn't train listeners. Anyways, I think this film that's, um, that was presented only looked at one side of the issue. Because from the point of view of the, the victims, they can only see the, like their own side. The rapists, on the other hand, I think they have, we should look at their sides too. The schools, um, in the film, they said um, there was uh, something that helped people who were accused of raping others. If you look at the statistics, at Harvard, there's barely, there's not even 200 cases of rape amongst, was it the number of cases in one year, or was it? There's 200 cases, 208 cases that have been reported. Okay, 208 cases. So, over all these years. Yeah, about 10 times. So it would be out of something like, what, like a million students who have attended Harvard or? It, um, do you have a question? Or? There's a comment. Okay, sure. Thank you for your comment. I think this can seek into another question about underreporting. Um, this is a very big problem across all universities, all institutions everywhere. And one of the differences, I guess, between Harvard and McGill or just universities in the United States is that our students spend disproportionately less time on campus because they don't live on campus. And also, a lot of the contexts or activities that take place that are in a McGill context are not physically even necessarily here. So that, like, with so many events happening off campus and so many, like, McGill sort of sanctioned things or even with the name of McGill sororities for, for groups that McGill does not technically affiliate with, there are a host of reasons why underreporting occurs. So I guess this would be a two-part question. One, uh, in our particular context, and as administration members who have to probably deal with this, uh, what are some of the major barriers to reporting that we have in place here? And then perhaps some initiatives that have been put into place to kind of deal with that. But I mean, we don't obviously have to broadcast too many things that everybody's working on, because those are all on these great websites that we can link you to. But more or maybe just a conversation about underreporting and how that might feed into the other phenomenon, which is like the fear of um, false reporting, which as we saw in this movie, not that this movie is definitive by any means, though they had eight studies verify there's somewhere of an average of four to five percent of all these, um, what is the word, claims are eventually false, which ends up being the same proportion as any other criminal report. So if you guys, if anybody wants to comment on that, that would probably be helpful.
solve itself. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic actually to Andre to speak about false security uh, on the university side. Well, I think everyone or anyone who makes a disclosure has a right to support, first of all. Uh, every disclosure is a result of some experience, some real experience. Now, whether that experience fits the legal definition of sexual assault or fits the Code of Student Conduct definition of assault is a completely separate question. Right? I think that's why in, in, the, um, in the development of the proposed policy, the emphasis is on support, and I think that's absolutely right. Uh, but when you say false reports. Um, the question to me is not whether uh, is not whether the report corresponds with a sexual assault as legally defined or defined under the code of student conduct. Right? Uh, the first concern is always this person who discloses needs support. And we're going to provide it. Whether that, that is tied into Part of your question, though, that, that hasn't been uh, summarized or, or addressed, um, from the point of view of the person under allegation, um, we do, of course, also provide some support to persons under, under allegation because they have rights. Uh, they're students, if they're students, of course, they're students, and that means that under the Charter of Student Rights, they have rights, for example, to uh, be, uh, they have a right to not receive academic sanction without clear, convincing, and reliable evidence. Uh, they, they may also need accommodation of various kinds, and we extend that uh, because they're students and they have rights. They also have responsibilities. And if they, have, they are in breach of those responsibilities, then hopefully there are consequences. Uh, Lizzie, yeah. um, rapist side of the story. I think there's a really big problem like, with these kinds of questions because it completely fails to recognize the fact that there are cultural systems in place that systematically prevent survivors from telling their stories, from sharing their stories, from like, reporting their stories, from having any sort of justice for what has happened to them. Sorry, this is like really emotional. But um, I would say that like rapist sides of the story are provided through media. For example, as we saw in the movie, like how uh, what's his name again? Yeah, James. James was like constantly defended in the media by this kind of narrative of like, oh, he's he's done like so much great work for this university, you know, like. How dare you accuse him of sexual assault when he's a great athlete? As if like those two things are even like remotely related. And yeah. So I think like the people that we need to be listening to are the people who have experienced sexual assault. Like, yeah, in a fair world we would be like devoting equal attention to like people who have like committed sexual assault and people who have experienced sexual assault. But right now people who have committed sexual assault are getting more attention, their stories are being told more than the survivors. So, yeah, I'll pass it to Francis. Yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, because we still see that, like, the, when the concern for the person, like, the perpetrator, um, alleged perpetrator, outweighs concern for the person who has, like, suffered this traumatic and violent crime <laughs> at the hands of that person, like, that's a problem. So you have like sort of what you saw in the film, like the like the perfect victim narrative. But like, if that person was like, yeah, I was drunk, or is queer, or I mean, it just goes on and on, right? But 
they were wearing, uh, what, you know, who they were with, uh, if, if they went home with that person willingly. Uh, you know, the, the girl in the video who said, like, she'd never go home with someone, especially not with three strangers. Like, that's, that's good, I and mean, that's fine, that's great, but, like, what if she was the person who would go home with three guys? She still doesn't deserve to have her consent violated, and nobody deserves to have their consent violated, and nobody deserves to be sexually assaulted. reasons why people don't report. There's many, many, many reasons, and like, if anyone's interested in talking more about that, you can definitely contact us, because I have a, a long list I drafted <laughs> recently. Um, but I'd say one of the main reasons people don't report is the fear of not being believed and being called a liar for the fact that they've come forward with their assault. This is something survivor after survivor after survivor does actually experience. It's not just a fear of something that will happen, it's something that probably will happen. And so for me, when people get really upset about like false allegations, I can understand where that's coming from because they, no one wants to be accused of being a rapist. It's a horrible thing to be and a horrible thing to do to another person. But we have to accept the reality that it actually does happen and then focusing on, on false allegations perpetuates the idea that people lie about being assaulted, uh, which perpetuates the fear of <laughs> accused of being a liar, which perpetuates under the brain. So, yeah, I, I hope people can like, reflect on how those sorts of ideas can contribute to a culture in which people are scared into silence. Yeah, there's definitely an element of coercion, especially when there's pressure and you hear things like, well, you don't know what this will do to that person if they're accused of X or Y thing. And that's something you see very frequently in the United States and probably, who knows, anywhere around you and like, for the rest of you go, if you work somewhere, that might happen and not. But it is a very recurrent narrative. And yeah, I was going to add, like, this stuff is complicated too, right? It's not just like, oh, you know, something bad might happen to them, but it's like, that person might have been your friend, like, that person might have been, like, your your boyfriend or, like, your wife or something, you know? Like, people, <laughs> you can be assaulted by someone who, it can be very complicated emotionally. You can, and there's a presumption that these allegations are placed almost lightly without consideration when that's really the opposite of the case. I had seen a hand earlier over here. say that at this point I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to some good developments next year. Let's hope. Athena, did you want to add something? students, the dean of 
the data foods is the person um, that is the point person in the reporting process. Uh, each faculty has a disciplinary officer that you can go through to speak to as well. Um, but if you're looking for support or advocacy, myself or Andre is the person that can help you through that process. Are there any comments or questions from the audience? So we are actually done now. <laughs> so perfect timing. Thank you all so, so much for coming out. This is, ideally, this is ideally just the beginning of the conversation. Actually, in the promotion of this event, we've had a lot of alumni reach out through personal channels asking how they can get involved. And it's just important to remember that the wounds you receive while at university, they don't go away. They just become scars over your time here. So it's really important to stay involved no matter what. Please get in touch with anybody, anywhere, all the time. Just get in touch with people. That's all you have to do. But in general, when it comes to this event, if you want to see more, if you want to get involved with the policy, uh, information's on this handy pamphlet, and it's also online in the Facebook group. Thank you all for coming out, and we hope to see you again. Thank you, Sarah, just one last oh, yeah. um, Thank you as well for coming out. Um, but we also would really like to hear your feedback. I know that was mentioned once before, but we're always looking to see how we can improve and better um, service the students at McGill. And one of the things that I'm putting forward is a sexual assault climate survey. and so. If you could pass that word along, if you'd be interested in filling it out, we're providing us with as much feedback. We're doing a complete overhaul in the way that we approach um, supporting resources at McGill. And so we would really appreciate your feedback on your perception of safety, access to resources, and consent to bystander activity at McGill. Thank you very much. <laughs>